But we are here today to attend the talk by Professor Jung Fuli. So Jung Fuli uh, is currently a tenure associate professor in Shanghai, Jiao Tong University, China. He was a research engineer with the NUS from 2013 to 14. He was a senior engineer in 2014 to 16. Uh, principal engineer from 2016 to 2018, and a member of technical staff from 2018 to 2019 with the Global Foundries as a design to manufacturing DFM computer at design research and development engineer. He is also serving as the IEEE CAS Board of Governors, uh, representing Region 10, and uh, IEEE CAS Standard Activity Subdivision Chair and IEEE JETCAS senior editor, and so on. He has uh, involved in different roles in many prestigious IEEE conferences, like ISCAS, EasyCAS, ICAS, NewCAS, ISVLSI, ASPDAC, and uh, APCAS, and uh, regional activities. He has organized several special sessions and issues in IEEE CAS journals and conferences. So uh, thank you very much again, uh, Jung Fuli, to uh, accept our invitation to present the talk uh, uh, today. And the floor is with you with you to start uh, your uh, presentation. Um, thank you, Professor Ricardo. So good morning and afternoon and evening, everyone. My name is Yongfu. So today I would like to share with everyone on this topic on design for manufacturability for nanoscale CMOS technology. This presentation was a tutorial, part of a tutorial presented in an APCAS 2023 last year. So this is a, a brief background of my work. Uh, previously, before I became an academia uh, professor, I was actually working in the industry to, so, to solve the seven nanometer kind of technology nodes. At the same time, how we can leverage on EDA tools to improve the quality of the design. So today I would like to talk about some of the, the techniques that being used both in the industry and how some of the problems are being brought forward as a research topic in the academia. So as we know that the history of EDA started very early, way back to 1950s to 1960s, when we have actually created the first CMOS devices. And that's where we actually make use of making transistors to make into a microprocessor like 4004. And later on, we actually realized that as we actually scale up the technology with the MOS law, there's a need for us to incorporate sophisticated kind of a PCB uh, EDA tools or IC EDA tools. And that's where uh, mathematics or applied mathematics come into very important use, how we can actually put, improve the performance of our EDA tools using graph theories and even different kind of mathematic ways to actually perform the placement and routing. In the last 20 years, we can see the technology has been scaling down still quite aggressively till like today, we are still looking at two nanometers kind of technology it's still being happening. But the challenge is that right now when we design our physical chips, there's a lot of things that we actually need to do behind it to make sure that it's actually print printable. So that's why in the, this, in the space of design for manufacturability or DFM, in short, we actually focus a lot of optical related kind of works. So what does DFM actually encompass on? DFM is actually an extension of our design, physical design rule checks. So in a sub 40 nanometer space, where we actually start to see the importance of DFM tools appearing in the market since 2010, even to today. And we are largely seeing all these tools are focusing on two, three different applications, solving two different types of problems. Usually we are referring to the systematic defects regarding our printability issues in terms of lithography, or it can be our back end of line kind of CMP polishing issue, where it can be a systematic kind of errors. And it can also be a random defects because when our geometry becomes smaller, the defect density will, will, will continue to increase. And how can we actually optimize the physical layout so that we can actually improve or reduce the, 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 the killer defects in the wafer? So to move on with my presentation, I would like to share with everyone about how the DRC has been evolving over the last few years. So to do that, we need to understand the basic understanding of DRC 1.0 and how DRC 2.0, when we call it the pattern matching technology, come into place and actually try to address the shortcoming of 
the existing DRC problems. So we can see that in our physical design space, it's very important for us to understand the minimum and maximum feature size that can be produced on every layers. And there's will always be a misalignment between different layers as we stack it up. So generally, we these two concepts, we have three different types of basic rules, such as a minimum size or width or minimum spacing, or lastly, it's a minimum overlap, or we usually call it enclosure. So in the past, before we get to know about our sub-130 nanometer technology, we are still very comfortable with using the concept called the Lambda Scalable CMOS Design Rule. And this has been very helpful for us scaling down from 600 nanometer technology way down to 180 nanometer technology. And beyond 130 nanometer technology, where we actually slowly shift from the aluminum process back end of line to the copper technology, there's a lot of new things being brought challenge for us. So that's why for this kind of process or matrix independence kind of design rules, it should start to fail us. And what happened is that we can see over here that one after 180 nanometers design rule two, even like sub 40 or even sub 10 uh, nanometer technology, we see that the number of design rules has increased exponentially over here. And generally design rules has actually evolved with the, with the new concept of DFM. So we have a basic rules that become more and more sophisticated. We can also use design, physical design rules or to actually enhance the design or to do design profilings. And with that, the coding levels has become harder. And that's why we can see that uh, generally that this pattern matching technology came into our EDA space. So pattern matching like our face recognition or many string pattern matching, a lot of things such engine has been used in many applications. So pattern matching has actually came in our space as early as 65 nanometer technology. As you can see over here that pattern matching actually helps to look into more, more than two dimensional problems. And these kind of problems are very hard for us to describe in the physical rules as of today. And you can see that on the bottom left hand side, even with our same uh, EOV or DOV kind of uh, lithography tools, we are seeing that geometry size are getting smaller and smaller. And this actually create more lithography issues. Let's take an example over here. We can see that on the top left hand side, we have the physical design layouts. And after we run, we run the lithography simulations, we still find that the layout pretty much looks the same, still reasonably good enough. But when we actually do the CD measurements or the same image, we can see that there are big points appearing. And these lithography weak points are often ca causing kind of a open and short connections in our physical layouts. And the only way to actually address it is to run very extensive kind of a lithography simulations. But this kind of simulation is very extensive takes up to several days and per, for each layers. And it's not very easily available for the end user. And that's why pattern matching helps to actually summarize those very difficult patterns so that we can actually focus on where to fix it. But you can see that uh, pattern matching uh, allow us to describe something in wordings or codings into pattern levels. It helps us to solve the development times, improve the consistency with our design rules, and also allow us to collaborate with our fabs, within fabs or even between foundries for faster development times and reduce kind of discrepancy. And what are the kind of technologies available behind pattern matching? So this is just a list of different kind of techniques that's being available. And all these tools are actually being available in all the EDS physical design tools, such as Cadence, Synopsis, even Mental Graphics, even way back in 2010. So this has been a very mature tool. But what is the problems that we are facing even when we have such tool with us? So I would like to present to you some of the two use uh, case study that I've done before when I was in the working industry and share with you guys what I did further when I actually joined the academia. So pattern matching really depends on patterns. So the question is that how do we identify patterns? So one of the case study that I actually done in the past is to how do we actually generate new patterns or how do we actually harvest patterns from existing designs? 
So there was a very interesting case study brought forward when we were working, when I was working in the industry, is that standard cells, as we know, is a very fundamental building blocks for building sophisticated SOC design. But a lot of times when we look into that technology, even way back like 10 years ago, this article was dated in April 2014, you can see that uh, the mental graphics director, Joe, mentioned that they actually observed hundreds of lithography hotspots. And these hotspots are not created. I mean, they are not actually appearing in the standard cell. It only appears that it, after the design has been done with placement and routing. So how do we actually prevent it? Or how do we actually improve the design quality of our standard cells before we actually move on to the SOC levels? So this brought forward a very interesting uh, problems for us is that shall we actually do a very iterate, iterative and random brute force PNR method to harvest all the patterns that will be generated by different PNR tools by EDA companies. And we try that and we realize that each iterations for any use case will take up a thousand of hours, in fact, to really get a, enough coverage. As you know, that place and route is actually a very insolvable kind of a, uh, I mean, the coverage will be very insolvable way of looking at the problems. So that's why uh, we actually look into uh, whether we can actually do permutations. That means looking at permutations of the abutment of the standard cells in a variety of ways, such that we can actually identify the unique placement patterns between the standard cells and we perform routings of it so that we can actually identify the possible problems around it. And we can see that runtime actually significantly reduced up to several minutes for more than 800 standard cell instances. And earlier on, we can see that we are spending more than 1 million, 1.6 million of instances just for one use simple test cases. And how we do it? So in, in fact, uh, abutting is a very simple mathematic problem. We realized that uh, a lot of things, I mean, even was proposed by Synopsys back then, there was a method for us to reduce the abutment. But later on, when, when I worked on this project, I realized that this is not the simplest available solution. So that's why I propose a, a, a more simplified methods instead of using six standard cells for getting all the abutment levels, I can actually achieve it with four standard cells and five standard cells, depending on what kind of context I'm looking at. And this actually uh, give me the opportunity to get the best uh, synopsis award. And this methods is actually incorporated back into synopsis tool later on again. The question is that now we have patterns that being abutted. The question is that how do we harvest the pattern? So, Back then, I will realize that uh, a full pattern is something that we've seen on the left hand side, which is known as the original patterns. The question is that a pattern makes up of number of polygons within the context. The question is that some polygons are generated in different contexts. For what example, we can see that in the first scenario, that the patterns can be intrinsically inside the center cells. The pattern can be generated when we are about two different layouts together. So this is where we, the first earlier work on optimizing the permutation in the standard cell abutments, help us to identify the problematic standard cells created when doing the abutments. And later on, we also realized that uh, when we have uh, routings across the different pins within the standard cells, it created a new patterns again. So that's why we actually define a, a new concept called the partial pattern matching, where we actually cemented the different patterns based on the number of polygons that we have and number of degree of segmentation that we want, we can actually have a rule of thumb where we want to actually fix the patterns. So some patterns are actually uh, I mean created through routings. Some patterns are actually created through adding VS to uh, upper metal layers. So we find that there are different priorities in solving because some of the patterns in terms of like placing the VS might not simply happen in most of the cases, but those will really happen right when we do a routing directly. Then that's where we want to actually fix it because there's always a cost for us to fix it. So the, the best way is that if the, the cost is right, if there are too many standard cells to be fixed, the question is that we have to prioritize the most important standard cell to fix. And then least important standard cell, we can actually exclude the, the use of standard cells when we see the similar problems during the PNR later on.
So this is how we actually harvest the pattern uh, in the in the world. So this is an example how we can actually make use of these partial patterns, incorporate back to our pattern matching libraries and to do harvesting again in our existing standard cell libraries. We did some case study and like earlier on, we do achieve a lot of reductions in terms of the placements. And likewise, we evaluated a, li a list of libraries with different number of standard cells and with different number of routing tracks. We realized that there are still quite a number of uh, standard cells will have this kind of similar problems. And in fact, when we have these tools in place, we realized that we can actually reduce all the possible uh, standard cell issues. And this has been part of our, I mean, part of IP qualification kind of things that we do. And later on, we realized that once we solve the patterns, we have to solve the matching issues. So that's why there's another case study that I brought forward was about proposing a new concept called the duplex pattern matching. It's in, in a very layman term, it's like a cost and find kind of a, a solving these problems. So what, what's the problems that we face is that when we actually have the same patterns, but we have same lithography issues when we scale down the geometrical size, we realize that the pattern becomes so small that it can easily create a number of false violations. But at the same time, if we use a very big pattern, then the question is that we are unable to capture patterns of very similarities or patterns or increasing the runtime or increasing the, the coding of the design rules. So how do we illustrate that example? Let me show you a very interesting concept because this is something, this is this this picture inspired me to look into duplex pattern matching back then. So we have good virus and bad viruses. The question is that when we scale down the scope to look at the virus, the question is that sometimes we still can recognize it, but and at a very small window size, we realize that the patterns are almost indistinguishable. So that's why there's a need for us to see how can we leverage on the trade-off between the big patterns and the small patterns. Small patterns run faster. It can identify possible uh, patterns. And that's why we actually combine this effort in this real example. So the duplex pattern matching involved two steps. First of all, with this given physical design or a picture, we can actually use a very coarse and very small patterns to identify the eyes of each viruses. And later on, we can actually use the cost pattern matching. And definitely we need to use cost pattern matching uh, mainly because this is actually qualified patterns. But in this case, you can see that we have identified new unseen patterns. So what happened is that this new unseen patterns give us the opportunity to improve the libraries. Because when we actually capture these unseen patterns, we can actually go through a, a, a more intensive lithography simulations. And this gives us an opportunity to harvest new patterns and to classify them or to improve the existing library. This is very important for us when we actually uh, emerge, I mean, just trying to deal with new technology because new technology before when we actually become a production technology for the end user, there's a lot of, I mean, uh, we are running against time to harvest all the different possible patterns to make sure that uh, we have a first successful tape -outs. So this is an example of the case study that was being reported in the, in the in my technical paper. And you can see that pattern matching is very useful technology. But the question is that uh, as, a, as an academia in the schools, so you wonder whether should we diverge into pattern matching? I, I would say that you do, because right now I'm still looking to pattern matching. But how I look into the problem is the better we can actually use GPUs to accelerate the, the search space over here. The question is that in academia space, way back in 2015 and 16, that's where the start of the AI has emerged because we can see that the pattern is an image. So my former colleagues from IBM also have created a deck design contest where we actually release a data set for the, for the students to participate, to look at how the, or in fact, it's an ICCAT co competition. So AI based lithography has become very popular in academia space. So we know that pattern matchings earlier on focus a lot of exact pattern matching. In fact, in, in, 
in our pattern matching space, we also has a terminology called a fuzzy pattern matching, meaning that if there are some variance in terms of the different width of the edges, we can also identify the, the patterns also. The question is that for deep learning, we can also do that. And this is one of the earliest work that we actually presented in 2018. And we actually try to do a feature extractions of the design. And we actually put it, all these uh, parameters and train a very simple ANN, multi-layer perceptron uh, models. And we actually incorporate that work with cadence and work with mental graphics and synopsis to incorporate this kind of a first version of TensorFlow kind of a deep learning space uh, pattern matching, I mean, AI pattern matching in our DRC tools. And that's where we find that very interesting. We say that uh, pattern, uh, that's where I start to realize that deep learning space or machine learning space generally are addressing two types of problems because these are always a labeled data sets. In any labeled data sets we are looking at, whether we are looking to a classification problems or a regression problems. I believe that right now, most of you who are playing with AIs, we realize that classification problems in EDA space is pretty challenging because for the design rules, we are expecting 100% matching. So it's very challenging for us to push forward deep learning space to address classification because you will never get 100% accurate unless you overfit the models. But deep learning space has been very important for regressions. And this has actually helped us to give us an, another perspective whether we can actually use deep learning space to generate new patterns for us. So this is a very simple summary between the pattern matching and deep learning that I shared with you guys earlier on. The question is that can we actually address the same problems, identifying patterns, identifying weak points using deep learning space? So most of you will realize that deep learning space, we are focused on three different parts. First is the data. The data that we have is the same as the data we have for pattern matching. But the question is that the feature extractions and data augmentations are something that are more important for training the models because with the right augmentations and feature extractions, you can actually train a much better model with the existing set of data. And that's why this I'll present two different case study. The first case study was actually explored in a, in a research community about how do we actually use AI or deep learning methods for design space explorations. So as you know, like here we have ChatGPTs, generative AIs can actually help us to generate a lot of new designs for us. It can be randomly designed. It can be trained towards a certain features or certain patterns that we want. And this idea was actually happened in our community way back in 2017 and 18. You can see that uh, for, for us, before it was actually in the research community, in the industrial space, we actually have been using this kind of a similar approach. But the techniques were slightly different because we are always want to generate patterns to evaluate design rules, building lithography process, building uh, process modules, or even to characterize some patterns that might not be taped out before. However, the question is that how do we do it? So there was only available tool for us in the industry back then was uh, using this kind of very basic idea called the Monte Carlo simulations. So Monte Carlo simulation meaning is that we generate arbitrary layout patterns and all the layout patterns you can see on your, on your left-hand side is that it can be pixelized. So when you can pixelize, it means that you can actually combine all these pixelized patterns into a very sequential pattern sequence. And you can actually create some weights for the randomness such that you get, get the patterns that you really want. But in the deep learning space, there are much more things that be happening. And I, I was trying to do something very similar in the industry also. But I think in the academia, there are actually much more, much fast ongoing publications we can see there are, there are different ways how we can actually focus on the pattern generation space, whether we are looking into a way of formatting it using the squish topology, or even to encode a two-dimensional patterns to a one single string. And with that, you can actually use two common types of or even three different types of uh, models, like of uh, auto encoder. We can also use GAN. 
We can also use sophisticated models like transformers. Even today, we can also use ChatGPT to actually help us because these are all based on the same concept of auto encoding kind of techniques. So this is one of the more recent work uh, I mean, published by uh, Hong Kong, Chinese Hong Kong University by Professor Yu Bei. So just share with you guys about their, one of the most uh, recent work is that we can actually based on some existing patterns and we can emulate different kind of patterns within there. So then the question is that in academia space, we will want to actually quantify the quality of the, the search space. So that's why we will have diff, two different kind of uh, matrix, like the, the pattern diversity or even the pattern validity, because some patterns might not be even generated through PNR at all. So that's why we will start to incorporate basic, basic design rules in our deep learning models to constrain it, to make sure that it actually can generate more constructive topologies. So this is actually some of the data they presented to, uh, two years back on the number of patterns can be easily generated out with very short runtime. So now we can see that patterns can be generated. The question is that can we do uh, augmented patterns? So data augmentation is the second topic I would like to share with everyone is how do we do perform augmentations? Augmentation really depends on how two, two different factors before we can look into augmentation we have to look into how we can actually uh, extract the features. Because once we are able to extract the features, we are able to quantify the search space, the patterns that's being augmented, whether the patterns are being quality, I mean, uh, having sufficient similarities or having differences between them. So there are four different kinds of uh, feature extraction techniques. And most of the common times we are known as the density based Industry really uh, most of the time will be using squish patterns, but in academia, we are actually using more on a feature tensor or concentric circle sampling techniques. So, but augmentation really depends on what kind of knowledge know-how that you can bring in to make sure that the data being augmented makes sense. So with my industry background, when I joined back the academia, my first thing is to why not I focus more on the augmentation techniques. So I based on my experience of what kind of patterns can be generated, whether it's through the lithography simulations, whether it's being added through matter fields and so on, we can actually permute different kind of patterns. And even with a very simple uh, deep learning models, we can actually achieve a very good work in, in over here. Okay, with that, we will realize that we have uh, patterns that we can generate, we can do augmentation, the question is that we have the models. Models can be in terms of very simple CNN models to even more complicated like transformers. The, the question is that can we actually fix the patterns? So in, in, in the industry or even in today when you are doing your design as a designer, there are three different ways of fixing the pattern that I would like to share with every one of you over here. So first of all is that lithography patterns are generated. The, the question is that the most easiest way is to do a very brute force method of, of rip and reroute. But you can see over here, rip and reroute will take extra space in terms of your routing space. So that's the, the, then there will be a very interesting thing is that how can we actually remove the pattern and replace with a new pattern. So there was something that I was working on in the industry, we call it the pattern optimizations, we call it the DFM pop, where we actually remove the patterns and replace the patterns that have been quantified by lithography simulation that having this extra margin of extending the wires, as you can see over here, we can actually resolve the lithography simulation rather than doing the whole rerouting space. So this was a very interesting work that I was trying to work on back then. But also there was a very interesting question is that, as I mentioned earlier on, patterns might not be generated through routing it can be simply generated through the placement levels. So again, you can see that we can also do patterns through shifting of the standard cells, through flipping and so on. So all this can be easily done by encoding this kind of constraint in your router tech file or router left file. So this was something that we were, I, I worked with Cadence to implement that in our, our PNR flow and likewise for Synopsys tools. Very interesting uh, work that we have done in, in the past. 
And the, the thing is that when we come to the school levels, we want to focus a lot of AI. The question is that where we can apply in AI beyond lithography. So there was a very interesting research topic about the wafer level kind of detections, because a lot of uh, defects when we seen earlier on is on the die levels. So defects can be systematic and defects can be randoms. So at the wafer levels, these defects, some of the defects can be uh, not very severe and some defects can be have more severe challenges. The question is that it does happen because some of the wire being open and short can create different kinds of severity at different corners or different parts of the die. And that's why uh, I think TSMC has a wafer being, I mean, uh, open source, the wafer map data sets. And I was trying hard to see whether we can get a bigger data set or different kind of data sets from different foundries so that we can see what are the problems that was faced beyond, I mean, from not within the same group of foundries of companies. And the very interesting fact is that only 20% wafers are being mapped. And we can see that there are generally different types of wafer defects, like central, donut, edge, ring, even like scratches and so on. The question is that, can this defect just being alone by itself or can it be a defect it can make use of different kind of patterns? And that's why we look at it, the patterns defects are generally classified to three different levels. Once on the wafer levels, once on the pattern levels, and once on the die levels. The question is that can we do augmentation techniques? And yes, we does. We, we do. So we perform different kind of augmentation te techniques, like what we adopt earlier on on the on the layout levels, like even like flipping itself, we can usually change from a center defects to become a donut defects. When we do a translations, we can shift the defects from the center to the edge. And this is also a different kind of group of defects. We can also increase the entropy by increasing the randomness or combine different random uh, patterns over here. And we can do all sorts of different patterns. The question is that how do we gauge the, the quality of augmentation technique again? Like we mentioned earlier on, there are different kind of signal processing, feature extraction techniques. Over here, we use a random transformation techniques to observe whether this kind of a mapping, whether it has similar features in terms of distribution. And in thus, we can see that we can actually increase the coverage of the augmentations. And that's why we can actually address, I mean, validate the impro improvement that's been done on the augmentation techniques. And we validate through training our data sets. And interestingly, we can use a very simple CNN models and we can actually achieve one of the state of the art work over here. So this is about the pattern matching research space that I've seen so far. So the question is that DFM, is it just related or manufacturing problems just related to lithography? Uh, not really, uh, no, not only related to lithography. In, in the back end of process, we also have uh, metal polishing. So this lithography followed by etching, followed by your planarization polishing, and that's where we stack layer by layers. So we can see that uh, CMP and lithography are the two most important uh, process in our backend of line. And these are very important because we are stacking more than 10 to 20 layers for our current technology. All these layers stack it up, they create a lot of challenges for us. For in CMP space, you can see that in, in even like in the EDS, we can either use a very rule-based techniques to do this kind of a pattern matching or DRC, or we can use AI to do this kind of classifications or augmentation. Can we use AI in terms of CMP? Yes, we does. Uh, but before to show you that, it's important to understand what are the problems in CMP space. We can see that the number of layers increases. There's a lot of things for us to build the right models. So that's important for us to see that layers keep adding up. There are more and more, uh, so I mean, you incurred a lot of run times, development times for building the right models. At the same time, you can see that when the matter stack get up, the, the topography height, that means the thickness, the wafer thickness actually changes at every layers. And this is a very accumulative effect. So accumulative effect means that you also create kind of a polishing issue. It also create a different depth of focus for lithography problems. 
And that's why this is important for us to see just a two-dimensional lithography problems, whether we can extend it to a 3D problems. And that's where CMP come to play. So this is a very interesting example that we've seen earlier on in, when we are dealing with the modeling. We realize that even like you can see over here, these are typically our power and ground kind of a metal lines in our design. And usually because of the, the space constraint that we have, we will do routing at different layers in between the power lines. And these are creating problems because they are of different density of different topography. And that's why these metal layers, metal lines at M5 layers actually cause shorting later on within the power lines. So sometimes when you do a test ship, you just turn it on, you realize that the signal is not running and it's connected to high and low. You realize that if you dig deeper, you realize that these lines are often found within the power lines areas. And also we realize that CMP can help us, modeling can help us to identify possible predictions in our layouts, whether this polishing will be accurate or not. So we've seen over here in, in way back in our 14 nanometer technology is that the, without the modeling, we realized that it was very hard for us to realize that the window size, the minimum feature size for, for our, our RX layers, our active layers was not really printable. So that's why this, this model helps the process to fine tune the process and iteratively improve the models later on. So modeling has become very important in CNP space. And these are uh, ways that we can actually incorporate different kind of a uh, methodology of doing data samplings, metrology collections, test ship designs. And later on is that the question is that you can see CMP has developed from, from our way, from very simple, uh, very traditional layer by layer kind of waterfall uh, collections to a single layer using a more bigger silicon space to speed up the development flow. And over here, uh, in, in when I came back as an academia, is that I actually went beyond that to look into how we can use deep learning space. Because earlier on, we, I mentioned that deep learning has a very good advantage of doing regression techniques. So in CMP space, we can actually use regressions for predicting the topography hikes rather than doing classification problems. And at the same time, uh, we know that the models keep updating itself. It's very time consuming for us to build the models. So that's why beyond data augmentations, besides identifying different types of layouts, it's very important for us to incorporate transfer learning techniques later on. And with the model in place, we can train the model much faster. And that's why we can actually build a better spot lithography or CMP hotspot. So CMP hotspot was very interestingly developed over the couple of years. We can see that hotspot can be very small islands in lithography space. If you, you just have to fix all the lithography patterns one by one like our DRC, but in CMP, it's actually a global problem. So if it's a global problem, it's more importantly to relook how we can incorporate back type of matter fields. And that's where we, we need to do a very basic way of analytics, how we incorporate clustering techniques to make sure that it's easier for us to represent the different problems, a different uh, location of the hotspots. And with that, we can also look into how we can fix the different matter fields. So matter fields in the past, when we are using our older technology like 130 or even older, we are actually using a very simple rectangular matter field. The question is that matter field, it has its uh, very limited uh, constraint when we only have a fixed size. So that's why a smart field concept, having a uh, few ships of different sizes come into play. The question is that how we can actually optimize it and later on, I realized that because a lot of metal fuels, smart fuels are based on density uh, aware kind of situation. And, and that's why we uh, propose to see how we can actually unify the weak points, the different kind of little CMP hotspot into one hotspot rules. And we generally just want, we want to make sure that we minimize the variations of the surface height. And with that in mind, we can actually optimize the smart fuel to make sure that it's a CMP aware. And when I came back, this was a work that was done in the industry. When I came back to the school, 
after when I built the CMP aware models, we actually finished recently we finished our CMP aware matter field works. And we are hoping that we can actually bring the works to the local foundry to see how they can help to solve the development time of build, building up the matter fields and even the CMP modeling problems. And lastly, to share with you guys about this, the presentation, we seen earlier on about the metals, systematic problems like lithography and even like uh, CMP problems. Then also there are challenges behind in addressing random defects. So in addressing random defects, there are two different ways of building the models or looking into how to fix the, the layouts. First of all, is an idea called the critical area analysis. And second of all, is actually how we can translate a DRC 1.0, a rule base to a scoring based method. So uh, the whole idea is about having this kind of uh, removing the random defect is to identify the patterns. So there are two ways. So the first of all, I mentioned CAA critical area analysis is a very stochastic way, a very statistical way or random way of looking at uh, identifying the weak points randomly. It is not that 100% coverage, I would say, at the same time, it, it, the runtime may increase exponentially. So that's why we actually look into how we can actually identify very simple things like our spaces, our width, our enclosure. How can we actually create a scoring methods for it? So these are very important ways of having these two tools in place and help us to improve the quality of design, helping us to work with the foundries to identify potential random defects because foundry are always expecting 100% yield. Systematic problems can only address up to like 80, 90% of the yield, 99%, but always the last 1% is about randomness. So the question is that how can we build that? So CA was one of the earliest work built by my colleagues from their IBM work in 2000 in ICCAT. And later on, it took more than, I mean, close to 10 years before it become a real product in the EDA space. And that's why I do encourage the EDA's community to work closely with the foundries or to look with, to, closely with design house to identify their, new, their problems and see how we can develop new models, new tools for them to, to address their issues. And subsequently, all these good works will be gradually adopted by the industry. So CA was a very simple idea. It's about looking at the size of different defects and based on that density, it can use a very simple Poisson equation to look into a modeling effects. So with that in mind, you can see that very small spaces means that you are having higher probability of having defects. And uh, with line width having a very small width, we can we are having probability of having uh, open or shorts. So the question is that we, we can use Monte Carlo simulations. We can also use, uh, like my colleague Paul, what we done, I mean, what they, they did was to use uh, deep learning methods to do the prediction because it's all regression. So you can actually build the data sets and later on train the models to help you to identify more critical space in a very short time period of time. And we also do test strips to validate the quality of the random defect size. And this actually has to be incorporated with the uh, work with two different companies like PDF Solution or Semitronics to do the uh, automation stuff. You can, you can see that we can also use, make use of optical metrology instead of building test strip to look into defects like wafer defects and, and make use of the wafer defects to build into uh, equation models again. And for the design rules, like I mentioned earlier on, it was a very new concept uh, originated from our team in, in 2010. And this work won the best deck paper award in 2012, if I'm not wrong. I mean, 2011 or 2012. So very interestingly is that we, instead of uh, deciding design rules to be a binary problems, we trade it as a equation-based models meaning that equation-based, we can use uh, Poisson-based methods or even exponential-based method depends on the defects we are observing in the foundry levels. And with that, we realized that 
everything needs to have a closed loop like I mentioned earlier on. Even you have design rules or detections methods, you need to fix it like CMP, even like lithography. So in the rule base, we also incorporate fixing mechanisms such that where we see places where we can extend the enclosure or increase the line width or space without violating the DRC or the DFM rules, then we will actually do that. This will actually help us to have a higher probability of having higher percentage of you later on, because these are all random kind of problems. And later on, we realized that this also can be very interesting because since it's a regression problems, it can be a classification problems also. So we actually code all this uh, location into our context and we also use a very simple uh, ANM models to do the modeling. So this is actually uh, the three or uh, four different applications of DFM in our community. And there, there are a lot of different uh, manufacturing based kind of uh, solution or problems that are being uh, started to actually explore in academia. I do hope that I get feedback from you guys or you guys can share with me your thoughts so that we can see how we can actually have the more in-depth collaborations kind of problems. So thank, thanks for your time today. I'll end off with my presentation for now. Thank you. Thank you, Yung Fu. Thank you, sir. Very nice uh, talk in a very important and fundamental subject, no? <laughs> we cannot uh, have a good chip without considering all these uh, points, no? So uh, I'm not seeing yet any question here in the chat channel. So if you have a question to Yung Fu, please do it uh, uh, as soon as possible. So I have one. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, uh, using the training for the AI tools, uh, uh, considering mm -hmm. different uh, design rule sets, so I suppose that you needed to do all the work again for each design uh, rule set uh, or how you work with it. So I believe you are, you are referring to the last example about how we can actually use uh, scoring methods for using deep learning methods for regression or you are looking into yeah, pattern yeah. matching? Yeah, you use uh, deep learning, uh, your... Uh, uh, the details you have in each design rule set are different, no? Yes, correct. So, like, even when we have an increased number of complexity in the design rules, but generally the design rules fall into three different spaces. We talk about the, the line width, the line space, and the enclosure. So these are the three most important parameters that we can actually enhance the design rules. Like those sophisticated design rules, like your reliability problems, like your antenna effects, or uh, these these are not really easily models in in deep learning space at this moment. But those simple phys, I mean line space line width enclosure, this can be easily trained. When we can actually generate the data, we can train the models, and we can actually use that to actually do a regression methods. For pattern matching, it's more straightforward because there have been patterns being available in the past. We just need to make sure that we have sufficient augmentation techniques incorporated into our training models start to prevent this kind of overfitting problems. Okay, thank you very much. So we have here a question by Thales Perez that is a undergrad student here in, in oh. Federal University of uh, Rio Grande do Sul. So I have a small question in the agile methodology. You said about increasing the silicon size want to disaccuse massive costs and the reducing of volume of ships produced? Was it this an uh, unfounded worry? Okay, so when we talk about building the models, like in example, like a CMP models, if we have like many layers, 20, 40 layers, the question is that can we still use a traditional methods of building the, the models layer by layer? And every layers that we build, we have to make sure that the wafer came out from the, found, from the fab to do metrology collections. So every time we will do this kind of metrology collections, these are very destructive methods, means that you cannot put the wafer back to the foundry and continue the process. So having a job method means that we actually increase the, the layouts a bit more, even several times, which probably is not a very cost, if I mean cost problem for foundry, because 
this will actually reduce the time for developments. Let's say we thought about having two layers, we put it in parallel. It means that we can ship out the wafers, take out the wafers at a very far, I mean, a very short period of time and build up two, two different models in parallel rather than we take out layer by layer and do it. So manpower cost-wise is actually much more considerable problems that we are facing in modeling, especially like you talk about CMOS technology, we are always running with the MOS law. Even to today, we are still fighting against MOS laws. We talk about how we scale down to 18 or 1.8 or 1 nanometer or even smaller geometries. Everything has to be done within two years time frame. If the process modeling is not that one time effect, it's an iterative effect. You have to build models, calibrate with the models, do the test ship, calibrate again, at least we'll do three to four times test ship before the wafer become a production level. So that's why time is actually more important for us than just spending extra cost in the wafer because wafer wise, I, I think it's not an issue for farming. Thank you. So if someone have another question, do it uh, urgently. So I have another one. Um, uh, you have also done some uh, research about the use of uh, this uh, approach to 3D circuits uh, through silicon via 3D circuits or monolithic circuits also. So, sorry, sir. Can you talk about? Can you repeat the question again? You have also and we done, we, we done we, we, 3D circuits. Sir. So, so, so sorry, I interrupt you. So can you repeat the question again? Uh, did you extend it also your uh, research to when using 3D chips, mm -hmm. using three silicon vias or uh, monolithic 3D and so on? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, in, in fact, uh, because uh, way back when I, way before, I mean, my experience with the, a lot of uh, application industrial DFM actually stopped in 2019 when I joined back the academy. But way back then, we are actually looking into that space on 3D because chiplet solu problems, I mean, chiplet solution was actually start off very early by AMD for the AMD chipset. So we actually look into how we can actually use redundancy or even like DFM rule-based kind of thing to, 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 to gauge how we can actually improve the TSV problems because like TSV, if you have like 10 or even 20 TSV, the question is that do we do a design level through redundancy or can we actually make use of design rules to extend it to make sure that they're more robust later on. So th th this actually was considered where we even if, I mean, we actually started, I mean, we already done that similar projects in that space, but I think for, for the, the current development, uh, 3D chiplets, all these, uh, are getting more popular problems within like last two years. And I think right now manufacturing has become more and more uh, mature because they are definitely using a much bigger geometry. The question in 3D chiplet space and packaging is about how do we reduce the cost about our TSV materials or even how do we achieve from the design space, how do we actually standardize the, the, the protocols. So in our IGB class, we actually have the standard activities. So we have a group of uh, uh, industrial and academia people. They are trying to develop an extended version of the chamber interface kind of problems. So if you guys are interested, do let me know. I can actually introduce you guys to the team that are working on the standard at this moment. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, Thales is doing another questions. Mm -hmm. Are there any problems you think the exponential development of AI will help in the development of your research? Yes, uh, in, in fact, recently, we, because of the ChatGPT getting more and more popular. So recently, I mean, last year, I, I wrote a paper uh, using how we can use ChatGPT to do translational works, meaning that when we, we know that a lot of the, EDA tools are available for us, whether it's Cadence, Synopsis, or even like Mental Graphics, and also China EDA tools at this moment. The question is that when we develop one EDA design rules, do we need to develop many multiple design rules across different tools? The question is that can we use ChatGPT to do it? Yes, we, we did. And what happens is that we make use of the design rules manuals, we study it, we extract the more important way of how we describe the, the, the the, the, the design rules, we trade into data sets, 
we actually incorporate this kind of in-context uh, learning methods that we can actually easily translate a caliber design rules to a cadence design rules and even to an open source K layout design rules. And later on, what we did is that we actually make use of the similar concept to do tech file translations, meaning that we are actually moving all the P our own PDKs that we have and open access PDK, open source PDK is that we can actually use ChatGPT to do a translation of work, meaning that we can actually enable a de quickly develop open source PDK with the use of ChatGPT. So I believe that ChatGPT or even the, the, the development of new AI techniques help a lot in EDA spaces. It all depends on whether what kind of problems that we are looking at. Okay, thank you very much. I see no more questions here. So I would like to thank you again, Yung Fu, for this excellent and very interesting talk. Uh, and uh, it's already very late for you, <laughs> Singapore. So uh, thank you very much and have a good rest. And no I hope to see you in person in the near future. So thank yes, you sir. very much. Uh,